this lecture is going to take a look at what life was like in the 14th century for Europeans. So we're going to take a look at kind of the problems within the church, and then that'll lead to eventually a trickle down to chaos known as the Reformation. We'll also take a look at changes in kind of writing style and the expansion of literature and literacy. And then lastly, we'll look at what what causes frustrations in terms of revolts and things like that that are really widespread throughout the 13th century. So let's uh, go ahead and start with looking at the church. Uh, and the conflict between church and state really begins with Boniface VIII, Pope Boniface VIII, uh, right at the turn of the 13th and 14th century. And Boniface is a firm believer that um, he, as Pope, should have more power than anybody else. So he gets into these squabbles with various kings, specifically with Philip the Fair of France. And in 1302, he <clears throat> releases a papal decree called Unum Sanctum. And the gist of that is that the Pope is not just in charge of spiritual matters, but also in charge of all secular matters. So all things that happen in the world, all worldly power, goes through the Pope, just like all religious matters and religious powers go through him. So really, he's trying to assert his, <coughs> his dominance over the kings and to claim that he is the one uh, who they should defer to. Now, this is kind of hard for him to do because he doesn't really have much of an army. And so the French realize that, and very quickly they capture Pontifus VIII uh, in a battle, and he is kind of forced to, in a way, retract his statements. He's followed up by another Pope, Benedict the... I don't remember his number. Um, Benedict dies very quickly. And following him, is they elect the Pope Clement V. And Clement is elected, and the problem is that Clement V is a Frenchman. And so he is more likely than others would have been to side with the King of France in these disputes. And so he kind of has this ingrained bias for France. And so what we see is that Clement V um, works together with the King of France uh, to get rid of the Knights Templar. Uh, he is the Pope who orders that decree. Um, and that's because the King of France wants the Knights Templar's land and money. But also, most importantly... We have the uh, Pope Clement V move it, moves the papacy, the office of the Pope, from its traditional seat in Rome to a French city of Avignon. And this is a real, real problem. Uh, and the French are pleased with this, but the Catholics in, in whole are not. Because what we see is that there's a massive decline in the power and the prestige, the perception of papal prestige uh, throughout the world because they're basically serving now as a puppet of the French king. And, and they're captives of him and they do kind of whatever he wants. And so this is problematic. Um, it really loses a lot of respect. However, they are able to find new sources of revenue through this inner working with the French uh, monarchy and taxation on lands that they've confiscated from the Knights Templar throughout Europe. So that helps them. Eventually, this whole nonsense is ended by... Uh, there's really one lady who leads this charge, and she is known as Catherine of Siena. And she has sets out on this mission to get the Pope to move back to Rome. Because in his absence, the peninsula of Italy is kind of crumbled, the papal states have fallen apart. That is the land that the Pope controlled around Rome. And so Catherine of Siena feels it's her duty to bring the, the Pope back. And she ends up succeeding, but along the way there's kind of all sorts of chaos. So the Pope's return to Rome in 1378. But the problem is that then they can't decide who they want to be Pope. So the office comes back, but they end up electing two separate Popes, Pope Urban VI and Pope Clement VII. And, of course, neither of them want to give up any of their power. They're both claiming authority. And so um, one is based in Avignon, one is based in Rome, and it divides Western Christianity. And this is what's known as the Great Schism. Uh, this is the second Great Schism in church history. 
But this Great Schism is one what we'll focus on today. And so kind of Europe splits into two to decide who they want to support. Meanwhile, people are just starting to get fed up with this because they don't really care much about this internal uh, papal politics. They just want to know who they're supposed to worship, how this is supposed to work, and if they can move on. So um, they there starts to be calls for reform. And one of the leading charges, uh, charges of this is Marsilio of Padua, and he writes a, a piece known as Defender of the Peace, in which he argues that really the kings have more power than the pope, and um, the pope needs to recognize that his role is secular, I'm sorry, is spiritual, that he's only concerned with the spiritual duties, and the kings are dealing with the secular of this world issue. At the same time, there's a movement known as conciliarism, and this argument is that the Pope really should have his power limited and be kind of subject to the councils of the church that are occasionally called. Um, and these councils would be where all the cardinals and bishops meet together to make decisions about church theology and rules and laws. And so there's kind of this push for the Pope to take a step back to these councils. Um, and it's really gains steam and is kind of reaches its high watermark with the Council of Pisa that's called in 1409. At this council, the churchmen agree that both of the popes, Clement the Seventh and Urban the Sixth, are unfit, and they depose both of them, say, you are no longer the pope, we are going to elect a new pope. And they do. The problem is the other two don't step down. And um, so now we have not just two, but we have three popes. We've kind of expanded our problem even further. And you can imagine that people are frustrated. This is an organization that's supposed to represent Christianity, the life of Christ, and they can't even figure out their own internal squabbles. So why would people be inclined to follow it? So frustration is really starting to mount. And that's kind of the lasting consequence of this great schism, is that people recognize that these are not flawless individuals, that these people have made huge mistakes, and that they are kind of sick of dealing with this. Uh, another council is called in 1414, the Council of Constance. At this one, they finally manage to end the schism and elect a new pope, Pope Martin V, who will lead them kind of forward away from this chaos. And keep the Council of Constance in mind because we're going to jump back to it in just a minute. And here you can see kind of the way when there's the schism, the way the, the world kind of, the Christian world divides, you have France and Spain, for the most part, having their allegiance to Avignon, as is Naples and Scotland. And then you have uh, Northern Italy, England, Sweden, Denmark, Poland, and Hungary, who are swearing their allegiance to Rome. And then within the Holy Roman Empire and Portugal, you kind of have a split. Um, and it varies because they are not nearly as unified as those other places. There's a lot more just kind of random dukes and princes controlling. But you can see that this falls along traditional kind of political lines and what will be more political lines as we move forward. Uh, but you can imagine then the confusion and frustration. At the same time, we kind of have changes in popular religion. There is a belief in these kind of mechanical paths to salvation. So if you follow these prescribed steps, you will reach salvation. Um, and so these are kind of new ideas. Instead of it being kind of an abstract concept, salvation, it becomes more kind of Follow these prescribed lines, and you will get to where you need to go, which is good for them. Uh, there's a rise in what's known as mysticism and lay piety, and mysticism is kind of a spiritual experience, kind of emphasizing the spirituality, and lay piety is laymen, so non-clergy, non-priests, non-religious, who are really taking ownership of their religion and ownership of their spirituality and their faith. And uh, Meister Eichhardt is kind of one of the lead leaders of the mystic movement, uh, and he kind of pushes that. He's joined by Thomas Akempis, who writes a real, pens a real famous book known as The Imitation of Christ, where he uh, has kind of a series of exercises and um, reflections, meditations that focus on living a simple life, but that is kind of that mystical lay piety um, that falls in that same vein. And then there's a new school comes out called Modern Devotion, um, and Ger Gerard Groot is um, one of the leaders and founders of that, and he creates what's known as the Brothers of the Common Life, 
and they focus on spiritual texts as leading to spirituality and kind of copying texts and the importance of that as all sorts of ways to access religion outside of the traditional structure of the church because they are so frustrated with that traditional structure and the schisms and the multiple popes and this chaos and that chaos. Uh, and then you also see, so there's kind of those internal struggles to change religion, kind of um, really increase devotion and stay Catholic, but go around these kind of leaders in the church. Uh, and then you have this kind of efforts to change the theology and the structure in the major teachings of the church. Uh, and the first is William of Ockham, and he has these concepts of uh, nominalism, where he's, he's really focusing on um, the basics and the kind of getting rid of uh, all the fluff and all the chaos that surrounds it. Um, John Wycliffe, Ockham is also famously known for uh, a philosophical thought known as Ockham's Razor. Um, and so, in, in his ideas, um, he argues that there are, he argues that if there's a, a problem with multiple competing hypotheses, hypotheses, like multiple solutions, the one that has the least assumptions is the one that you should choose. So he's trying to kind of break down all the complexities into kind of how simple can we make it. Uh, so that's William of Ockham. And then you have John Wycliffe, who's in England, uh, and he's pushing for scripture alone as a source of authority instead of scripture and tradition, which would be uh, the Pope and the bishops and their writings. And that's very much a result of his frustration with the, the hierarchy and the power structure of the church and these... Um, these Babylonian captivities and Avignon and stuff like that. He wants the church stripped of all its secular power and its land because he doesn't think that there's a need for the church to have that land. Uh, and so this is a kind of a breakthrough and eventually um, we'll see that Martin Luther built some of his ideas off Wycliffe's ideas. And then the last one is Jan Hus and uh, his followers are known as the Hussites. And he builds his ideas off Wycliffe. He's in the Czech, Czech Republic, modern-day Czech Republic. And he translates the Bible into the local Czech language. He really gets all his followers to read it and believe it. And he really inspires a series of Czech nationalism. And uh, Jan Hus is, is a really important figure. And in fact, his followers rise up against the Holy Roman Empire and against the Pope. And the, they send an army to go deal with him. They lose those battles, and Jan Hus and his followers kind of carve out this little semi-autonomous Czech kingdom. Eventually, the church leaders say, hey, Hus, like, come meet with us at the Council of Constance. We want to hear your ideas so we can kind of work together to solve this. And he believes them and takes them at face value, which, of course, you shouldn't because he shows up and is immediately arrested for heresy and condemned to burn at the stake, which he does. So that's kind of the religion uh, aspect of it. There's a lot of changes in vernacular literature around this time period. And when we talk about the vernacular literature, we're talking about people who are writing in local languages, um, not Latin. So Latin had been the traditional language for anything written in, and the vernacular was not. The vernacular was the local language. So French, Spanish, Italian, German, English, whatever that was, that was the vernacular. Uh, and so in this 14th century, we start to see a lot of people write in uh, the vernacular more to expand their literature, um, to expand who can read it, who has access to it. And some of the most famous books of all time are written during this era. Dante pens his Divine Comedy, which is a three-part book, um, The Inferno, The Purgatorio, and The Paradiso, in which he goes through uh, a journey through hell, purgatory, and then heaven. Um, and it's kind of a comedy in ways, and it's a social critique, because as he's in hell, he's pointing out all the people who he thinks are there, including various popes and religious leaders. So it's kind of funny in its way, and it pokes fun at the people around him. But it's also a good critique of the church at the time. Petrarch is an Italian writer, and we'll get to him in the next chapter as we look at the kind of early humanists. He is kind of the first of the humanists, uh, but a really important 
uh, writer, and he writes a number of sonnets uh, that deal with love and kind of loss and, and the struggle of people. Boccaccio is an, a, another Italian writer, and his famous work, The Decameron, deals with uh, Florence during the plague, and it is also intended to be a comedy. One of the things is that comedy doesn't translate super well over time and space. It's really culturally dependent. Um, Geoffrey Chaucer writes the famous Canterbury Tales, which is a series of short vignettes on, about a group of travelers on a pilgrimage to Canterbury, and they each take turns telling stories. Also a comedy, also really funny, um, if you were living at the time, and you could translate it into modern day scenarios and would find it humorous as well. Christine de Pizan is one of the few female writers at this time. She writes the book of the City of Ladies and talks about the way ladies are expected to behave during this era. And then um, what we see in not so much the writing, but in art, is that it's very much affected by the world around it. So Giotto is one of the famous artists, and um, we talk about how morbid the world was, how much death there was, and that really influences art a great deal. And so within the artwork, we see a lot of themes of death, destruction, and despair, uh, just popping up time and time again in art. So why do we have this rise in the vernacular literature? Um, well, during the Middle Ages, all documents, all books, everything's written in Latin. The problem is very few people could, could read or speak it. It's exclusive to people in the church, and um, a few noblemen could. Not a ton, but a few could. But it's mostly just the people in the church. And they needed to know how to do it so that they could read the Bible. So they could access the Bible and the old texts. Um, but no one else would understand what was being read to them. Um, so we see that slowly uh, more people are able to speak Latin because there's a rise in the university system following the Black Death. So once everyone's died, especially all these priests, there's this real need to kind of create a more educated public. You need to fill in all the educated people who have passed away, so you build more universities to do that. So we have more people who could speak Latin. So very slowly, uh, you have more people who are not priests who could speak Latin and are able to access that. Um, but again, that's a real slow rate of change. The larger percentage of people who could read could read in the vernacular or write in the vernacular, their local language, languages that they spoke on a daily basis. And because of this, writers started writing in that local language because they could sell more books, more prints, more people were able to actually read it and engage with it. Uh, and so we see this beginning of a rise of literary culture that really culminates uh, with the printing press invented by Gutenberg in 1450, 1454, somewhere in that time period. There's also a, a greater number of change uh, changes happening in uh, the world at this time. So in, in the urban life, you see there's greater regulation on life, on prescriptions of what you can and cannot do. Uh, we'll talk about marriage a little bit later. But in the kind of gender roles, you have men as being kind of the active and dominant force and women as being uh, submissive to them. And they're supposed to be more passive. So that's very much a traditional like role for women in cities. This is very different than what it was like in rural areas where everyone pitched in and families were a lot more equal. But in cities, there's this idea that the men are the dominant ones and the women are submissive. You see uh, medieval children, ex they're around, but this concept of childhood doesn't really exist. There's very little emotional attachment to children at this time period because so many of them die either in childbirth or so young. Um, very few actually make it to adulthood, so parents don't really care or get emotionally invested in their children until significantly later in life. So the concept of childhood as we know it and as we have it does not exist during this time period. Uh, in medicine, you begin to see some experimentations. There's new hierarchies. There's universities that study medicine specifically, and you start to, well, not yet, but eventually there will be dissections to actually understand the way people are, are uh, made. And you see trends away from accepting the old Galen, work of Galen and the four humors in balance and towards like actual empirical data. The mechanical clock is invented around this time, so now you actually have a concept of time and days 
and meeting schedules, and it really is a huge change. You're not just based around sundown, sun up, but you can understand the concept of a day in different hour blocks, and, and you can divide your day a little more um, kind of efficiency, efficiently. And so you have these, this is why we see these massive clock towers throughout uh, Europe, because they built them as kind of the center point, so people would always know what time it was. And then you have the invention of gunpowder and cannons, which transform, again, very much so, the way the war is fought and the way the world is. And this is a, a traditional medical textbook. And you can see it's not exactly great science. Um, we're not dealing with super intricate knowledge of the body. This guy up top's got a couple arrows in him, just hanging out. But apparently he's still alive. This guy's cut open, trying to figure out what's wrong with him, and this guy says his heart hurts, and here we come with medicine. So there's this is what doctors would learn from. So it was all about finding balance. Doctors felt that if you were ever sick, your your humors, four humors, were out of balance, and they would have to find a way to f restore that balance, um, whether that was through bloodletting or through leaching or, or various other things. So that's what we've got going on. During this time, there was also great social upheaval, especially out in the countryside and then eventually into the cities. But um, there are peasant revolts all over the place during the 1300s. Um, and, and the reason is peasants are finally just fed up. There had been a high tax rate on them forever. Um, and there was never they never saw punishment for crimes that aristocrats would commit. So they would aristocrats would come kill peasants, rape them, steal their stuff, um, hit them, beat them, you know, basically just take full advantage of them, and there was never any repercussions for it. And so the peasants are finally fed up with being treated as subhuman or second-class citizens. Really, not even second-class, but third- and fourth-class citizens. Um, and so they're finally fed up, and so these a series of revolts break out. Um, the first is in Belgium in the 1300s, uh, and it's just in its... Again, it's all these consequences of hundreds of years of being repressed and then um, what they perceive as opportunity for the um, advance because of deaths from the Black Death and then not getting those opportunities or dealing with the noblemen trying to keep them um, in check and finally they just rise up. The problem is these peasant revolts are always just crushed very quickly because, as I've mentioned before, when they're fighting they have their basically their farming tools as their weapons and no armor and they're going against noblemen and knights who are in armor with armored horses and swords and really that's not much of a fight at all um, and you see that every nobleman will come to the rescue of a local nobleman whose peasants are rising up because they fear that peasant revolts in one area will inspire them in another and they do. So the first one's in, in Belgium, and then it spreads to France. Um, the one in France is the result of um, high taxes from the Hundred Years' War and the oppression and death and killing that comes from that, as well as bad uh, food production and their frustration and desire to get the food that they perceive as being theirs. And this rebellion is known as the Jacquerie, and it's named after a fictional pre French peasant named Jacques, who kind of is fed up with the peasant lifestyle and the lack of food and leads this revolt. Um, and so they're all they're all called the Jacquerie. Uh, in England, again, high taxes from the Hundred Years' War and efforts like the Statute of Laborers to keep their wages low uh, lead to rebellion. They're also frustrated from a lack of protection from these just marauding noblemen who can do whatever they want, or even highwaymen who aren't noblemen, but will just steal things from peasants and then there's no repercussions. And so eventually this frustration boils over and leads to various revolts. In terms of what marriage and sexuality was like, we'll look at that. Um, and there's a lot of thought recently that suggests that this uh, this pattern of marriage also contributed to the revolts. Um, so we'll get to that in a second. But the idea at this time is that men and women should be independent before getting married. So they should no longer be living in their homes with their parents. They should be able to support themselves and their family. Uh, the problem is that passing land on doesn't happen until the parents are dead. And so people are kind of waiting for their parents to die to take over their land and get married. And in that time period, they're either working more. Some times women are working as domestic servants. 
uh, men are farming. And so we have uh, people getting married later in life. Um, for women, they're getting married later than they previously had been, men also later. And so this kind of throws off the balance of what had been traditional European society. In addition, in the cities, many men were prohibited from marrying. So if you were an apprentice, you could not get married. Uh, if you were studying at university, you could not get married. If you were in the clergy at all, obviously you couldn't get married. Uh, but you, what happens is you, they create this large number of young men who don't have families, who don't have prospects of marriage, who are just kind of hanging out for a number of years, and there's unrest that builds within them. And so they're often at the center of these revolts within the cities. Uh, and they kind of start and cause this chaos. Uh, and going along with a number of young men without any families tied to them, um, we see that brothels are becoming very prominent during this time. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of them. They're kind of everywhere. And uh, there's efforts to crack down on that, but never really works or is done very seriously. And then, unfortunately, um, at this time, rape is not uncommon. Uh, and the burden of proof is on the women. They have to prove that they were raped, that they fought back, that they said no, that they called for help. They had to do all of these things for the man to be proved guilty. And very rarely that happens. Um, so often what happens is the woman simply asks the judge um, to force the rapist to marry her. That way they save honor. They're not stigmatized within the community. So you have this degradation of women that's ongoing, uh, along with kind of all these men running around everywhere. So you can imagine that it is kind of chaotic socially um, during this time period. And all of this building on the frustration with the church and the lack of authority or direction coming from the church is really setting foundationally, um, setting us up socially for the Reformation that is to come in just a hundred or so years.